Hello and welcome to this edition of Outlook Potion's first thousand day campaign. Our special guests today are Dr. Lawrence Sadad, economist and executive director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition and the winner of the World Food Prize in 2018. We also have with us Mr. Ravi Bhatnagar, Director of External Affairs and Partnerships, Africa, Middle East and South Asia of Rekit Bin Kaiser. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. Let me just, you know, kick off this thing with a question to Mr. Dr. Haddad, after which I'd like Ravi to sort of take over the rest of the questions. Uh, Dr. Haddad, this pandemic has impacted nutrition programs across the world, I suspect, but, you know, particularly in, in, in the developing nations. What kind of impact do you see it, I mean, having, particularly in nations like India and, and on, you know, uh, the programs for women and children? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Yeah, the, the COVID crisis has impacts on nutrition in three ways. First of all, it disrupts the rollout of programs, uh, vitamin A supplementation, diarrhea prevention and treatment, um, severe acute malnutrition, those kinds of programs that are highly targeted to nutrition. It disrupts those because health clinics get, get disrupted through closures and lockdowns. Second way it affects nutrition is through food prices. Uh, food is absolutely, it's crucial. It's not the only thing that's important for nutrition, but it's absolutely crucial for good nutrition, especially early in life, post breastfeeding. And uh, food supply chains have been disrupted, food markets have been disrupted. And so you get wild price fluctuations in uh, foods that are very perishable, such as vegetables, fruits, eggs, dairy, uh, meat, fish. These are the kinds of foods that are very high in, in micronutrients. So that's a problem too. And then of course, income collapses for lots of people. Lots of people can't work anymore. Their livelihoods are decimated. And so for these three things coming together, the estimates are that the number of kids that are wasted worldwide, so the wasted means they're, they're too thin for their height, their skin and bone. It's a very, it's a very, um, very worrying form of malnutrition. The numbers globally pre-pandemic pre were about 47 million. And uh, some estimates that I and a, and a whole group of researchers have been involved in show that this is going to increase to 55 million uh, in, in a six month period. And many, and the majority of those cases are to be found in India. So with, we're projecting a 14% increase in the number of stunted kids. And I think that number will apply to India too. So it's, and that's just the first six months. This is gonna go on for um, years. So we need to mitigate those, those numbers very quickly. Great, I think Ravi has a bunch of questions for you. Over to you, Ravi. Uh, thank you, Ramananda. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. It's uh, great to be here on this show today. And it's great to learn about your all the achievements on the nutrition space and all the awards you have won. Uh, I myself, you know, I'm a public health practitioner and a public policy specialist, uh, you know, and uh, I happen to work with a company which has very strong uh, purpose uh, definitions and our approach is very, very strong on the work what we do for the nutrition. Uh, uh, one of our recent uh, social return on investment study, what we have conducted on our uh, nutrition program has given one rupee invested, giving return of uh, 39 rupees. So we'll be happy to share that on a later note. But uh, before I you know, discuss it more, I have two small questions for you. We will start one by one. And uh, the first question is, pandemic has substantially eroded the gains made in the last few decades due to the loss of livelihood. What strategy do you suggest for our government to prevent marginalization of the vulnerable section while maintaining and regaining the momentum in the portion of Yam? This is my first question, sir. That's not a small question. <laughs> but um, and, you know, I'm, not a, I'm not going to make recommendations to what the Indian government should do. Sure. But governments in general, uh, you know, I think there are two things they need to do, well, three things, really. The first is to make sure that public procurement of food and public distribution of food, any, any kind of safety net or subsidized program that involves food, make sure that the quality of that food does not diminish. And, and if you can, improve it. So instead of just focusing on grains, 
add some add some pulses because pulses are really rich in good good proteins add if you can add some f- dried fruits and 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 vegetables if you can so that's the first thing keep the social protection programs going because they reach the poorest keep them going and if you can improve the quality not not diminish the quality second thing is keep programs like food fortification going food fortification is where you add vitamins and minerals to staple crops to cereals and this is a very cheap and effective way of getting essential nutrients to everyone especially the poorest and this is really important to prevent infection not necessarily from covid-19 we don't know if there's any correlation or relationship between a uh, higher quality nutrition diet and covid-19 infection but we do know that good nutrition prevents all sorts of other kinds of infections and we know that covid-19 thrives on comorbidities so that that's what, what i would do keep those social protection programs going uh, it's really important for livelihoods and then you know double down on investing in farmers um if it, it, the 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 harvests this year i don't think were worldwide weren't quite as affected by covid-19 because of the timing of covid-19 but they could very well affect next year's harvest which could lead to a really massive food crisis in a year's time so really protect farmers especially the smallholder farmers through finance get 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 you know not not grants but through lending programs get get good pr- lending low cost lending programs to farmers and smaller medium enterprises in the food system those are the two things i would really be focusing on thank you on on your on your comment about the social returns to nutrition uh, programs that 39 to 1 is very similar to numbers that the academic literature has generated for scaling up nutrition programs so it's it's a very credible estimate and 39 to 1 what a fantastic benefit cost ratio higher than the stock exchange over the last 100 years that ratio uh, higher than many road and port and bridge projects in terms of benefit cost ratios investing in nutrition is a fantastic economic investment as well as a fantastic health and human rights investment thank you so much uh, amit my small second question to you is it said that one of the silver lining of the pandemic is that where people are increasingly turning to the healthier habits like washing hands with soap using mask or avoiding outside food in order to build immunity or protection from infections do you see this as a situational compulsion or is a substantial behavior change to towards- is leading healthier and hygienic life i think there i think we do see substantial behavior change whether it's whether it's temporary or permanent is is an, an open question i don't think anyone really knows that yet i i have seen big behavior change in people i think um where they can afford it and that's not and that's not everywhere people are looking a bit more about where their food comes from um is it is it locally sourced can i trust this food uh, there's a bit more distrust of food that comes from far away versus food that's more local uh that might be good for local economies the thing i have noticed the biggest behavior change i've noticed is in politicians because uh politicians and i'm i'm based in the uk right now and uh in the uk the government has Uh, made the connection between obesity diabetes hypertension and heart disease and the fact that people with those conditions experience covid-19 symptoms more severely and so they've been using that as a way to uh, reinforce anti obesity messages to say look um if we reduce obesity levels it also reduces the severity of covid-19 and that's that's been interesting and i think that that is potentially a big impact and of course in india in diabetes is a, is a big and growing problem one of the biggest ncd is actually in india which is a non communicable disease yeah so third question actually comes from a very interesting book which i was uh, reading called the spillover so spillover is written by the david david coman so in the book it talks about the animal infections and the next human pandemics 
it's a very very highly rated book and uh, the new york times has written about it's a book of the year etc etc so my question is in that light actually what steps we can take to ensure that the next pandemic or epidemic or crisis does not derail these programs again especially on nutrition so what should be done i'm really a big fan of the idea of one health which is a human health planetary health and animal health those those three things coming together it's a good way of thinking about the trade offs um so I, i think you're absolutely right one of the reasons we're seeing more of these um uh transmission of infection from animal to humans which is called zoonosis as you know we're seeing more of these because the the space that humans uh, occupy is encroaching more and more on the space that wild animals occupy so we have to be really careful ar- about encroachment into into wild life spaces we have to be really careful about the um conditions within our open food markets our fresh food markets our wet food markets we have to be really careful how we handle food about food safety protocols um especially when it comes to animal source foods and animal source foods are very important for um populations that are undernourished it's a really good source of protein and vitamins and minerals it's highly digestible highly bioavailable to the body but if you consume too much animal source food you're susceptible to coronary heart disease diabetes other forms of non-communicable disease and you're you're generating big greenhouse gases emissions and you may be encroaching into um uh wildlife spaces and you may be um using production techniques that are very um, that are not good for the for the animals that are, while they're alive so i think you know and the the production and consumption of animal sourced foods is going to be a hot spot for for many years to come it has multiple dimensions and it needs to be carefully monitored and carefully managed thank you so much for your uh, wonderful response on this my next question takes me to something which is very much related to education space and nutrition uh, like in many countries across the globe uh, there is adolescent sexual reproductive health which is taught in the schools uh, then there is hygiene curriculums which is taught in the schools especially in the countries like india bangladesh sri lanka and many more uh what about you know teaching similar kind of nutrition curriculums in the school and making the you know the generation the school children prepared and they know about you know they can distinguish between the right nutrition the proper nutrition and between the junk and others so that that that's a that's a very important point which i would like to you know uh, get your opinion on that's a super important point i mean it, the earlier you can get kids to uh reframe the way they think about food it's not just fuel it's actually nourishing your body so it's not just reducing hunger it's 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 not we call it uh, at gain where i work we call it nourishing dreams adolescents especially they think about dreams a lot they they want what are they going to become when they're when they're an adult are they going to become a, a politician a business person a doctor you know um uh a sports person an artist a business person you name it they they've got dreams and the key is to link those dreams to what they eat i think that's very important so there's that and they need to learn about what's good and what's not good to eat they need to learn that tasty is not always good for you and they need to learn how to prepare food and buy food and store food So these are all really important things and and you know it's important to get kids when they're young because these are lifelong habits that they then um teach their own kids. So it's absolutely vital. I don't quite know why schools and this is the case in the UK as much as it is in India, schools don't see this as an essential part of the curriculum and I don't really understand why because I don't know like why this comes a, you know at the color of the plate what is your tiffin looks like Yeah. you know you know that um if you're a health professional you know that food is the number one driver of disease and mortality yeah. higher than unsafe sex higher than bad water bad health higher than air pollution uh higher than um uh, road accidents yeah. this is the number one driver of mortality and morbidity above, above everything 
So why we're not teaching our kids about this in the school, I, I don't know. And we could, we could, we could be involving uh, chefs very, very well. You know, there are lots of TV shows with chefs. We could, we could, and they'd be delighted to to be involved in these kinds of things. My next question focuses about you know your own organization and its uh, strategy on the large school, uh, large scale food fortification. So what's the vision behind that? and how you're using technology like artificial intelligence or something else so that the benefits reaches to the last quintile. Yeah, I mean, GAIN, Gain is, a, is an, an NGO, non-government organizations, non-profit, and we try to connect food systems, everything from farm to fork, to improve nutrition. Because when you think about all the different actors in the food system, all the different choices they make, they very rarely make choices guided by what's the impact on nutrition or on diet. So we try to connect those two things and we do it by connecting the public sector with the private sector. And the private sector is the main actor in food systems. Most people buy their food. They don't grow their own food that they eat, they buy their food, even low income populations. If you look at the data from India, 90% of food that is acquired is purchased. So you have to engage with businesses. It's not a question. We, again, we think that businesses are part of the problem, but they also must be part of the solution. We can't sort of ignore them. And about 20% of our work is on large-scale food fortification. The other 80% is, is working with smaller, medium enterprises to help them expand their businesses in the nutritious food space, helping them getting ready for investment, helping them get access to investment and, and loans, and helping them basically develop their business case so that more healthy food can be available at a lower price to more consumers. Fortification is about 20% of our work, and it's an important part because it relies on adding nutrients to foods that low-income people already consume. So you don't have to convince people to switch from this food to this food. Um, you don't have to rely on SMEs and small businesses growing. You can rely on some of the larger uh, processors and manufacturers to deliver these kind of staple foods. And, you know, it's, it's a very low cost, very highly effective way of improving um, micronutrient consumption. So we think it's very important. We are using um, AI more and more to connect um, food consumption patterns, with um, the consequences of food consumption patterns, but also to connect with the actions that are needed. So if you're in a, if you're in a food, if your food system in a state in India shows, uh, you know, and we've, we've constructed a food system dashboard, which has data on India. Uh, one of the things we want to do is to make that a state level dashboard. It's not state level yet. That's, that's, that's in the works. But if you're a state in India and you've got your food system is described by 150 different indicators, everything from production through to consumption. The question then is, well, how do you make sense of that? How do you say, well, given I've taken the temperature of these 150 indicators of my food system, what does that mean for action? Does that mean I should start in the production side in the consumption side, in the processing side, in the storage side, in the distribution side, where, where do I start? And AI is a really helpful way of connecting uh, that, all of that data with a, a menu of outcomes. Uh, my last question to you, what my you know, public health degree uh, you know, makes me ask you this question. You know? So the question is, uh, in India, you know, nutrition, uh, world over, the nutrition-sensitive investments are leading the global donor portfolios. And same is reflected in India also. The CAGR is around 11.2% at this moment. And it's continuously growing. So people are not able to, you know, understand, like, uh, should we invest more on the nutrition-specific interventions or the nutrition-sensitive interventions? And how to balance between the two? That's a really good question. And... Uh... You know, I don't think anyone really knows the answer to that. I, I think it's, I think it's uh, part that the answer is partly based on technical uh, evidence. We know, we know that scaling up nutrition-specific interventions, and for your listeners and, and readers, nutrition-specific interventions are interventions that their primary goal is to improve nutrition. 
nutrition sensitive programs are te tend to be much bigger in terms of budget, but nutrition improvement is only one of several goals and it may not be the primary goal. So an example of a nutrition sensitive in intervention might be the PDS or MREGA or, or um, yeah, or some other kind of social protection program or an education program. So how to get that balance right? The evidence tells us that if you scale up nutrition specific interventions, all the way up to 90% of coverage rates, you'll deal with about 20% of stunting. So that's a big chunk, but it's only 20%. So the other 80% has to be found from elsewhere. So, you know, I think that's probably, uh, you know, probably the first strategy is to scale up your nutrition specific as much as you can, and then make sure there's a really good set of nutrition sensitive programs that are supporting that. Nutrition sensitive programs don't usually require a lot of extra money to make them nutrition sensitive. It's more of a design issue. The budget is already there. It's a design issue. The nutrition specific require extra money to scale interventions up so it's you know it's that combination of technical political what's the political appetite and and also capacity what capacity do you have to scale nutrition specific and redesign nutrition sensitive so it's more of an art than a science i'm afraid very interesting thank you so much so uh, uh over to mr ramananda hey thank you so much you know uh, I, I really appreciate that the, the, the conversation, the twist that this conversation took, because some of these questions were, you know, uh, answers to which I give, and I was looking forward to. Um, I really appreciate the fact that the two of you took time to do this. That was uh, Dr. Lawrence Radar of Gain and Mr. Uh, Ravi Bhatnagar from Reckitt Ben Kaiser in a fascinating conversation on nutrition in the time of the pandemic. I look forward to having both of you again with us sometime soon because this is a long time campaign and I hope to have both of you again. Thank you so very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having us.